Hello and welcome to today's session. Today we focus on this particular essay by Rene Velik. It is titled The New Criticism Pro and Contra. So, this is one of the rare essays which has tried to defend the notion of new criticism. So, let me also give a very quick background to the idea of new criticism. Uh, Eliot incidentally is considered as one of the precursors, one of the progenitors of new criticism though the term had not gained much currency during the time of his own writings. So, in 1929 when I. Richards published his much celebrated work The Practical Criticism, new criticism began to gain much currency. And new criticism was nothing but a formalist school of uh, theoretical scholars. They focused only on close reading and they focused particularly on this genre poetry and it also encouraged looking at literature as a self-referential aesthetic object alone which also meant that the other social historical considerations were not of much importance when one was engaging in a close reading of a literary text. I. O. Richard's practical criticism was a collection of a series of readings done by university students without any reference to secondary material or any reference to any uh, biographical uh, details and it engaged with the text purely as an aesthetic object. So, that was a kind of notion on which uh, the entire idea of new criticism was based and obviously in the coming decades it also drew a, a lot of flack because uh, many were also of the opinion that literature will lose its value, its inherent value if it is looked at merely as an aesthetic object completely devoid of any other extra literary concerns. And um, there, there were of course multiple uh, viewpoints floating around about the idea of new criticism and also about employing that as one of the methods for literary reading and literary judgment. And this was also one of the ways in which reader response theory <coughs> was also uh, getting wide currency. And we also find a move in this early 20th century particularly towards the middle decades of the uh, 20th century, a very pertinent move from the liberal humanist approach towards formalism. So, uh, there were a lot of discussions going around about this and Rene Velik wrote this very well structured essay, uh, the New Criticism Pro and Contra to take stock of what new criticism was and also give a very objective judgment of the, 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 uh, the ways in which new criticism needs to be understood and more importantly the ways in which new criticism had been misunderstood in the critical sphere. So, here we start with the essay. Today the new criticism is considered not only superseded, obsolete and dead that is what uh, happened to new criticism after a few decades, but somehow mistaken and wrong. So, this essentially in the first uh, statement itself, we realize that Rene Willick is trying to defend new criticism, looking at this particular uh, school of thought, if we may call it that, as a set of uh, notions which were also terribly wronged. Four accusations are made most frequently. He makes a list of these four at the outset. First, the new criticism is an esoteric criticism, a revival of art for art's sake, uninterested in the human meaning, the social function and effect of literature. So, one of the criticism was that there was something very, very private about this kind of evaluation. It could not be considered as a universal yardstick. It could not be considered as an objective yardstick because a close reading also meant that each individual will be engaging with the literary work in his or her own way. And that would not be, that cannot be considered as entirely individualistic or entirely uh, objective. So, the new critics are called formalists and formalism incidentally was not considered as, uh, w w was mostly considered as a pejorative term and it was coined, an opprobrious term used first by Marxists against a group of Russian scholars in the 20s. Second criticism, secondly we are told it is unhistorical, new criticism is unhistorical. It isolates a work of art from its past and its context. Thirdly, the new criticism is supposed to aim at making criticism scientific or at least bringing literary study to a condition rivaling that of science. We saw that in the essay that we uh, recently took a look at, Tradition and the Individual Talent, where Eliot is using a scientific analogy, the analogy of chemical reaction in order to talk about the aesthetic processes which are at work. And finally, the fourth criticism is that new criticism is being dismissed as a mere pedagogical device, a version of the French explication de texte used flat most for American college students who must learn to read and to read poetry in particular. So, these are the four notions which is almost sounded the death knell of new criticism. And Rene Velik is trying to situate new criticism in a more historical sense and trying to make a case for uh, new criticism wherever it was uh, unjustly wronged against. 
I want to show that all these accusations are baseless, these four uh, accusations primarily. They can be so convincingly refuted by an appeal to the text that I wonder whether current commentators have ever actually read the writings of the new critics. So it's a historical survey of the ways in which new criticism had emerged and also looking at the various frameworks within which the ideas of new criticism were uh, situated. Rani Velik attributes this to the ignorance of some critics who are entirely unfamiliar with the series of works which were produced during that time and he also believes that new criticism is valid and will be valid as long as people think about the nature and function of literature and poetry because we also know how new criticism ever since uh, I. Richard's practical criticism in 1929 came into existence we know that it had a very major influence in the way ways in which literature was beginning to be taught within um, universities within schools. Rene Velik very appropriately positions this uh, discussion and he begins by asking us to take a look at who are the new critics entirely. We must come to an agreement as to whom we should consider new critics. So and he gives a historical sense of this by quoting from different works which were produced from the early 20th century from the 1920s onwards and uh, he says in 1941 J.C. Uh, Ransom, John Crow Ransom who was a founder of Kenyan Review, he wrote a book New Criticism in 1941 which seems to have established the term in common usage. Even though the book was far from being a celebration of the new criticism. Ransom discusses there not contemporary American criticism in general but only three critics. So the, this book which was published in 1941, it identifies only three critics as new critics per se. I. Richards whom he criticizes sharply, T. S. Eliot against whose views on tradition he makes many objections and your Winters whom he rejects in the strongest terms. It earned him a virulent reply in Winters Anatomy of Nonsense. We shall not be going into those details but the important thing to be noted over here is that as uh, uh, Rene Velik tells us it is important for us to know who could be considered as a new critic and what are those uh, elements which makes uh, this sort of a definition possible. So in the initial stages only three of them were considered and about whom J.C. Ransom the author of the book also did not quite agree with but these three uh, critics were of course I. Richards, T.S. Eliot and Vior Winters. And now he is trying to look back from that moment in 1941 when Ransom's book was published and look at the terms and conditions under which the, uh, the, the notions of new criticism had begun to be described. He says one can best observe their gradual emergence by thinking of them as a reaction against the then prevalent trends in American criticism. So this is seen as most other schools of thought as most other new ways of criticism. This was also a reaction against certain prevalent notions of uh, uh, critical frameworks. Without too much simplification, we can distinguish four main trends in American criticism before the advent of the new critics. And here we also find that this is there is a movement that literary criticism has made from uh, England to America. And there is a certain way in which as uh, uh, Eliot also encouraged us to think about it in that way. There is a certain way in which the entire mind of Europe and by extension the entire idea of literature is coming together in order to talk about particular kinds of trends and uh, frameworks. And the first one he says was a type of aesthetic impressionistic criticism, a uh, type of appreciation ultimately derived from Peter, Walter Peter. And uh, the second one the humanist movement and there he locates uh, critics such as Irving uh, Babbitt, Paul Elmer Moore. And in the 1930, he also talks about the great public emotion around this idea and these uh, sort of critics. And then the third group of critics who attack the genteel tradition, the American business civilization, the Bubusi, that propagated the naturalistic novel, Dracers in particular. And finally, he talks about the Marxists or the near Marxists who flourished during the Great Depression in the early 30s. So these are the four milestones that he locates uh, with respect to the emergence of new criticism in America. And whichever kinds of works that he surveys, it is very evident that the influence of T.S. Eliot was very, very decisive and also I. Richards. So uh, Eliot's works, he says from 1920 onwards and Richard's Principles of Literary Criticism from 1924 onwards, they had in certain ways, in multiple ways, laid the foundations of this new school of thought which later came to be known as uh, new criticism. But before we get too comfortable in calling this new criticism as a school of thought, René Velik also warns us that one cannot perhaps refer to this entire group as a, a homogeneous group. 
If we look at this list of names, we soon discover that the group was far from unita unified. There was hardly anything homogeneous about this group. Ransom, Tate, Cleanth Brooks and R.P. Warren may be grouped together as Southern critics. Burke and Blackmer stand uh, apart and your winters was a complete maverick. I could collect and quote a large number of their pronouncements violently disagreeing with their supposed allies and show that they hold often quite divergent and even contradictory theories. So this complexity about new criticism was not something which was highlighted when practical criticism became a big movement became a big thing the way uh, uh, almost determining the ways in which literature could be taught in universities. So. What René Willick does it at this point is he is trying to unpack this entire tradition and show us that there were a lot of uh, divergences within this seemingly homogeneous group. And this complexity helps us to take a closer look at a more serious look at new criticism and uh, engage with it in uh, serious terms as uh, Willick also wants us to. So René Willick is here clarifying to us in very clear terms that the view that the new criticism represents a coterie or even a school is mistaken. He is encouraging us to take a look at the many complexities which are inherent within this seemingly homogeneous group of critics who are collectively known as the new critics. With the evidence of disagreements among these critics, which it would take too much time to develop in detail, it may seem wise to conclude that the concept and term should be abandoned and these critics discussed each on his own merits. I have done so in the forthcoming fifth volume of my history of modern criticism where I give individual chapters to each of these men. Some chapters, chapters in preliminary versions on Ransom, Blackmore, Burke, Brooks and Wimsett. Yeah? So it is, uh, René Willick even goes to the extent of looking at each of these critics separately rather than clubbing them together under this uh, common umbrella term, under the common rubric term, uh, new critics. And, uh, of course, it does not mean that we cannot group them together. René Willick is coming to that uh, in the following passage. Something tells us that there is some sense in grouping these critics together. Most obviously, they are held together by their reaction against the preceding or contemporary critical schools and views mentioned before. So this is one major thing which brings them all together that they were all departing from the tradition which were prevalent until that point of time. They all reject the kind of metaphorical evocative criticism practiced by the impressionists. Tate, Blackmore, Burke and Winters contributed to a symposium highly critical of the neo-humanists. Similarly, again while pointing out how they were similar, how they could be grouped together as a set of critics who also shared certain kinds of critical judgments and critical frameworks together. Uh, well, well, it further points out, furthermore, they were almost unanimous in their rejection of Marxism with the single exception of Kenneth Burke, who in the 30s passed through a Marxist phase and anyhow, his first book moved away from his neocritical beginnings. So, uh, Wellick is being very, very practical over here when he is talking about how these set of critics are very, very varied and there cannot be a homogeneous way in which they could be kept together. He is also trying to address this question of how they are unanimous in certain ways as in the rejection of whatever kinds of traditional uh, uh, critical frameworks which were prevalent during that time and also in the rejection of Marxism which was indeed a big thing from the 1930s onwards as we know. And then well it gives a certain background, a personal anecdote which is also important for us to understand how this discipline began to emerge, how literary criticism as a different uh, distinct discipline began to emerge and what were the challenges and how it had to compete with literary history for that matter. And this understanding ex uh, is extremely important for us to situate. Uh, literary criticism within a historical uh, framework, within a, uh, a chronological framework. And I read to you from this uh, essay. I remember that when I first came to study English literature in the Princeton Graduate School in 1927, 50 years ago, no course in American literature, none in modern literature and none in criticism was offered. Of all my learned teachers, only Boris W. Kroll had any interest in aesthetics or even ideas. So he's also trying to tell us that there is a certain trajectory, certain academic as well as historical trajectory that literary criticism as a discipline had to go through. It was not as if it, uh, criticism was always 
taught and criticism was always at the forefront in academies. It had to go through a certain historical trajectory in order to find a place for itself as a distinct discipline, uh, just like literature is today. Most of the new critics were college teachers and had to make their way in an environment hostile to any and all criticism. So this is also very, very important for us to understand that in the 1920s and in the 1930s, uh, even at that point of time when they were all writing about different kinds of literary frameworks and the need for different aesthetic yardsticks, there was a hostility from these academic settings as well. It was not always, it was not as if criticism was always already welcome into the uh, uh, academic fraternity. Only Kenneth Burke was and remained a freelance man of letters though he taught in later years occasionally at Bennington College and briefly at the University of Chicago, but he very early deserted the new criticism. It took Blackmer, Tate and Winters years to get academic recognition, often against stiff opposition and even Ransom. R.P. Warren and Cleanne Brooks established in quieter places had their troubles. Ransom's paper, Criticism Inc., pleaded for the academic establishment of criticism. So this move is extremely important, the academic establishment of criticism, which is why it's also important for us to pay attention to these different trajectories, how the, in the early 20th century, criticism began to be seen as a creative thing itself, as an important output itself, not as a secondary thing, which was less important than the, uh, the, uh, the creative genius who was creating literature. And thanks to him and others, criticism is now taught in most American colleges and universities, but it was an uphill fight. I still remember vividly the acrimony of the conflict between criticism and literary history at the University of Iowa, where I was a member of the English department from 1939 to 1946. So he's giving a very very, very clear description and graphic description of the personal struggles that he had and how he witnessed this academic establishment of criticism within uh, English and American academies. And Wellick has also further pointed out another similarity that he has noticed among these new critics. The new critics with one voice question the assumptions and preoccupations of academic scholarship with different degrees of sharpness. The wittiest and most pungent was Alan Tate. In a lecture, Ms. Emily and the bibliographer, Tate exposed the vain attempts to emulate the methods of science by tracing influence conceived in terms of forces, causes and effects or biological analogies of growth and development or by applying psychology, economics and sociology to literature. We may or may not agree with this proposition, but it's important for us to notice that this is one of the points of convergences which also enabled, uh, uh, which also enabled us to bring all the new critics together. And he also ta tells us about one of the important uh, phases that criticism had to go through. As uh, he points out, the professors who engage in serious literary study, bibliography, philology, textual criticism and related disciplines not only hold criticism in contempt and do their best to suppress it in the universities, but also Winters tells us bluntly where fools and where they still flourish, they are still fools. So there was this ongoing acrimony between these different frameworks of literature, each trying to uh, compete with each other before uh, a distinct place was accorded to the study of criticism uh, uh, as a separate discipline uh, altogether. And in the following passage, he goes on to challenge this claim word that new criticism had entirely reject historicity. This is how this passage begins. Still one should not understand that this rejection of academic historical scholarship must not be interpreted as a rejection of the historicity of poetry. And this is something which uh, 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 perhaps a misconception which also had led to a lot of criticism being uh, leveled against, a lot of charges being leveled against new criticism as a framework. Clean Brooks in many contexts has shown, uh, Clean Brooks has in many contexts, mostly in interpreting 17th century poems, shown that the critic needs the help of the historian, all the help he can. The critic, he argues, obviously must know what the words of the poem mean something which immediately puts him in debt to the linguist. So there are these different disciplines coming together, contrary to the belief that new critics did not want literature to engage with anything else. And since uh, many of the words are proper nouns in debt to the historian as well. In order to interpret the Horatian Ode of Andrew Marvel correctly, we must obviously know something of Cromwell and Charles I and the particular historical situation in the summer of 1650 to which the poem refers, but historical evidence is not welcomed only as a strictly subordinate contribution to the elucidation of a poem. So this clarification is extremely important given that new critics were perhaps unjustly seen as being hostile to historicity entirely. But with these examples, uh, uh, René Velik is also showing us that that was not the case, that historicity, whenever it was needed, and uh, as, as uh, Tate also 
uh, as Kleanbrook uh, also uh, tells us, whenever the help from historian was needed, the critic was advised to get all the help that uh, one could. And now further putting this in context, particularly with, within the historical context, uh, Wellock argues, Brooks and all the other new critics reinterpret and revalue the whole history of English poetry. So, that is one of the major contributions that is being highlighted over here, which was also ignored by most of the other critics who are vehement critiques of, uh, who are vehement critics of uh, the new critics. And he tells us how the, uh, there is a, there's an act of historical imagination which is found to be at work and this also led to the revision of the history of English poetry to exalt Dawn, uh, Dunn and the metaphysicals, to reinstate Dryden and Pope, to sift and discriminate among the English romantic poets, preferring Wordsworth and Keats to Shelley and Byron, to discover Hopkins, to exalt Eats and to defend the break with Victorian and Edwardian conventions as it was initiated by Pound and Eliot. So, this historical imagination, this new historical framework which had uh, emerged that was indeed the result of the close reading which was encouraged by uh, the new critics. And to sum up this point, Wellock very clearly argues, I would argue that the new criticism embraces a total historical sch scheme, believes in a philosophy of history and uses it as a standard of judgment. So, uh, it, it would not be wrong to say that it was a very simplified uh, version of new criticism which was being presented and that was a version which was being critiqued vehemently as well that it that new critics entirely rejected historicity that while privileging close reading they were also sidelining the historical aspects which are also important for the understanding of the, uh, of the poem. So, Wellock very very uh, clearly and succinctly argues that that was not the case. And uh, he also gives us the example of uh, T.S. Eliot, who had all these engagements with history. If you look here, look through his uh, uh, through his poems, uh, the historicity uh, of the modernist period and the uh, significance of the past is very much over there. Even in the essay "Tradition and Individual Talent," we see that he emphasizes on the role of the past in order to make sense of the present. So the close reading and the labor with which art needs to be engaged with that is seen within a very very pertinent historical uh, context which is heavily rooted in the past. And uh, well it goes on to give us many examples in favor of his argument that uh, new criticism did not reject historicity that it was very well in alignment with the kind of history that was important to understand uh, literature that was important to make sense of particular kinds of poems. So, we will very uh, quickly skip to the next session. Now, he is responding to the criticism that the new critics were obsessed with form alone. Uh, he says, in the writings of the new critics, the coherence of a poem is not studied in terms of form as the label formalism suggests. Actually, the new critics paid little attention to what is traditionally called the form of a poem. So, this is another uh, fresh point that Wellick is trying to make. But he says, the new critics rejected the distinction of form and content. They believe in the organicity of poetry and in practice constantly examine attitudes, tones, tensions, irony and paradox, all psychological concepts partly derived from Richards. So, this close reading, it is not just about the words which are there on the page, words which uh, together come to form of poem. It is also about engaging with these various dimensions which are part of this uh, uh, work of art. So, uh, in, 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 in close reading, it is not the common compromising of the various other elements which, uh, uh, which, which eventually happen, but in close reading what eventually happens is an engagement with these multiplicities which come together to make the poem. And again he sums up uh, quite rightly, the new critics are overwhelmingly concerned with the meaning of a work of art with the attitude, the tone, the feelings and even with the ultimate implied world view conveyed. They are formalist only in the sense that they insist on the organization of a work of art which prevents its becoming a simple communication. So, this clarification comes across as very very handy because we tend to simplify the many yardsticks which were put forward by the uh, new critics and we tend to look down upon them as being mere formalists. But we also realize over here that form has an important connection with the meaning that the poem is conveying. So, in that sense uh, the new critics we understand that they are really concerned about the meaning of the work of art which they are engaging with and it is not, it's not just about making sense of the words, but also about the general attitude and even about the world view which the poem tries to communicate with its readers. And uh, the uh, responding to the criticism that new critics wanted to see literary criticism as a 
science he finds that very claim very uh, preposterous that allegation very preposterous and he says it might have emanated from those who felt hurt by their attack on appreciation on loose impressionism and mere self indulgence in adventures among masterpieces so all that the new critics wanted to do apparently was perhaps to bring in a certain kind of a structure and order to this entire process of criticism so that it is not seen as an access uh, so that it is not seen as an exercise without any kind of uh, uh, firm boundaries any kind of firm uh, um, uh, frameworks so velik uh, again stells as a contrary and goes on to argue in favor of that saying actually the new critics are enemies of science science for tate is a villain of history which has destroyed the community of man broken up the old organic way of life paved the way to industrialism and made man the alienated rootless godless creature he has become in this century science encourages utopian thinking the false idea of the perfectibility of man the whole illusion of endless progress and he says tate says bluntly and here velik is quoting him poetry is not only quite different from science but in its essence is opposed to science so this close reading that velik is now undertaking the way in which he is engaging with a series of texts which have come together to contribute to our understanding of uh, new criticism uh, velik is actually uh, trying to tell us that new criticism is not what Uh, many thought it was in fact it needs to be engaged with in more serious terms in order to refute the uh, refute the many allegations put forward against it and in order to understand the historicity the uh, historical trajectory within which uh, uh, new criticism as well as the new critics were uh, situated and uh, velik also says that maybe when they were trying to bring in some kind of objectivity into this exercise of criticism they could have been misunderstood as being taking over uh, scientific methods like he says if they sometimes spoke of criticism as a systematic rational discipline they could not mean a modern value free social science for they always stress the necessity of judgment the qualitative experience poetry gives us maybe in terms of method in terms of the structure and order they perhaps wanted certain kinds of scientific methods also to be employed but at the end of the day it wasn't a value free objective neutral kind of uh, approach or a response that they had to literature but it was very inherently a qualitative experience which was very subjective as well and uh velik also remembers to uh show how the new critics were different from the romantics that it wasn't just a uh a visionary romantic thing that they were putting forward he clarifies this is not a claim like that of uh, the romantics for some visionary power some special insight into a world beyond which might lead to an obscurantist theory of double truth it is rather a view of knowledge as realization as full awareness in the sense in which we can say you don't really know what it is like until you have lived through it it is ultimately a version of the unified sensibility of T.S. Eliot the union of feeling and intellect achieved in poetry and this, these are the places where we find that Eliot's tradition and individual talent is an essay which brings him closer to the ideas of new criticism criticism cannot be neutral scientism it must respond to the work with the same totality of mind with which the work is created it cannot be entirely scientific on on the contrary it needs to move away from the methods of science in order to achieve that kind of qualitative subjective judgment that uh, the new that new criticism is also trying to highlight but criticism is always subordinated to creation its humility contrasts precisely with the aggressions the impositions of science so it's a very gentle modest point that uh, Velik is trying to make over here about making criticism uh, as a subordinate category when compared to actual literature actual creative work and here he says the entire argument the scientific argument also falls flat because the humility with which the critic approaches a work of art or criticism approaches a work of art it is in stark contrast to the aggressive way in which science engages with things and now talking about close reading further velix says that the method of close reading was the most important pedagogical weapon of the new of new criticism one should grant that the proliferation of explications became later a dreary industry but it is a mistake to consider close reading a new version of explication the text close reading as practiced by clean brooks was clearly different from this french method which only focused on the text and towards the end of this argument uh, velix also tells us that close reading did not alienate the text from its extraliterary world close reading did not alienate text from the surroundings 
uh, within which it was produced. On the contrary, although the process of reading is inevitably temporal in criticism, we must try to see a work as a totality, a configuration, a gestalt, a whole. That was what closed reading also eventually tried to achieve, to, to, to see the uh, text as a whole, as a gestalt, in order to lead one closer towards the process of, uh, uh, towards the meaning making process. And uh, then he says he hopes that he has succeeded in refuting the common misconceptions about new criticism, but I have studied the history of criticism long enough to know that there must be reasons for the fact that new criticism is currently so in disfavor. So like I uh, mentioned earlier, Wellick is very, very practical in his approach. He's not blinded by his uh, arguments in favor of new criticism. On the other hand, he takes a very balanced view. First, he talks about four major misconceptions which he thinks should be entirely dealt with, should be defended against. And in the second half, towards the end of this uh, essay, he also tells us about the reasons that he has come across, which he believes, uh, which had brought much disfavor to new criticism as a critical practice. First, he talks about the influence of the Chicago Aristotelians as one of the important movements which must have led to, led to the new critics falling out of favor. The Chicago Aristotelians who exalt plot, character and genre strongly disapproved of the new critics concern for language and poetic diction. So language and poetic diction was con considered as um, inferior compared to the uh, the, the bigger and stronger elements of literature such as plot, character or genre and uh, Chicago Aristotelians were also followers of Aristotle's uh, poetics who wanted to bring back the Aristotelian, the classical tenets back into criticism. And he says the new critics fared badly in their hands and this sort of criticism was not something that the new critics could really uh, survive. And while advocating a rational systematic study of poetics, which is what the Chicago Aristotelians did, even though their insistence on strict genre conventions and neutral analysis were unacceptable to the new critics concerned with the nature of poetry in general and with criticism as evaluation. So that is one of the major historical movements that uh, Wellick sees as, uh, as having led to the new critics falling out of favor within the critical circle, within the critical uh, tradition. And the next one he says, perhaps is the emergence of myth criticism. Myth as a system of metaphors or symbols is a central device in much of new criticism, but in the myth critics it becomes the one overriding concern. Poetry is simply and I think wrongly identified with myth and myth is used so broadly that it includes any theme, any story you can think of. And myth criticism allows a discussion of content apart from the poem and that is also something which had contributed. Uh, to, to uh, contribute it in a very negative way to uh, a new criticism. And uh, new, criti new critics were also uh, very uh, directly, very uh, uh, heavily rejected by the critics of consciousness. Uh, the, those were the Geneva school of uh, critics and uh, we find that it also had a very adverse effect on uh, new criticism. And then uh, with these multiple groups embracing Marxism and also bringing in Marxism and its tenets in, into the uh, literary frameworks, we find that the, the, the distancing from new criticism was more and more obvious and the, the, uh, the end of new criticism was almost inevitable and quite sure. And, and finally he says, even the religious preferences, the overt religious preferences of some of these new critics also must have del uh, uh, led to the uh, decline and the demise of new criticism. As he points out, surely one of the reasons for the demise of the new criticism is the distrust many feel toward the political and religious views of the main new critics towards T.S. Eliot's Anglicanism, which is shared for instance by Cleon Brooks or toward the Roman Catholicism of Alan Tate or William Winsart, as well as toward the participation of three southern critics, Ransom, Tate and R.P. Warren in the so-called agrarian movement formulated in the symposium, I will take my stand. So we find that their religious political preferences which were not in alignment with the uh, emerging trends that also had uh, struck a very severe blow to new criticism. And we also know that uh, Eliot's criticism was very Eurocentric, it was very white, very male and he also, it was uh, politically very conservative and it also promoted a certain kind of Christian conservatism which uh, uh, got infused into the literary traditions and the art sticks as well. And this uh, combination of religion and uh, literature 
this uh, uh, infusing uh, of uh, literature with uh, spirituality or certain kinds of religion that did not really go down well when the close reading became uh, one of the major things that uh, the new critics became concerned about because they also thought that the critics of new critics also thought that that would uh, have a very lopsided view of literature in general because it privileged, it would tend to privilege certain kinds of world views and certain kinds of uh, uh, literary views and literary yardsticks over the other. And uh, he sums this up in this uh, short passage. If one rejects this version of history, one can see the justification of a new turn in poetic taste, the revival of the English Romantics as the visionary company centered in Blake and the current attempts to dismiss T.S. Eliot, both as a poet and critic, and to reduce the role of all modernism, imply a rejection of new criticism also in the everyday matters of selection and ranking of poets and poems. The one advantage of Verene Velik's essay is that he uh, is able to look back uh, as at, at these four to five decades and then see how the historical trajectory had taken new criticism through and he is also as a, at a very uh, advantageous position when he is able to have a very balanced as well as pragmatic approach towards this evaluation of new criticism as a uh, critical practice. And finally, he also gives a personal touch to this criticism when he says one of the limitations was the lack of any kind of comparative framework. They are extremely Anglo-centric, even provincial. They have rarely attempted to discuss foreign literature or if they have done so, their choice has been confined to very few obvious texts. Dante. And we uh, know that even Eliot had preferred to discuss Dante whenever he wanted to talk about anything outside of England. And uh, in, in the world outside of England was just Europe for him. It was a very, very Eurocentric perspective. And here, uh, Velik is even more uh, compulsive in his uh, uh, criticism. And he says it was a very Anglo-centric worldview, Anglo-centric critical view that was being promoted by the new critics. Dante is discussed by Alan Tate. He also comments on passages in the Idiot and Madame Bovary. Winters admires uh, Paul Valéry. Blackmore late in his life, he wrote on uh, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy and Flaubert. A recent excursion of Kenneth Burke into uh, Goethe seems most unfortunate. This is about all. So, it is a very limited literary world that the new critics were willing to explore. The close reading was limited to an Anglo-centric perspective. And even when uh, some of these foreign writers were discussed, the comparison was largely based on the uh, Anglo-centric uh, and the uh, Eurocentric frameworks which are already always already in place. And he says, uh, and, and, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, he sticks to his point and says he continues to consider this as a very, very serious limitation of new criticism. And having come to the final passage, there is a certain kind of tribute that Wellock offers to uh, new criticism. He says uh, he, he cannot uh, deny his conviction that new criticism had uh, reiterated many literary truths to which we will keep going back to like the specific nature of the aesthetic transaction, the normative presence of a work of art which forms a structure, a unity, a coherence and a whole which cannot be simply battered about and is comparatively independent of its origins and effects. The new critics have also persuasively described the function of literature in not yielding abstract knowledge or information, message or stated ideology and they have devised a technique of interpretation which often succeeded in illuminating not so much the form of a poem as the implied attitudes of the author. So, it is not entirely about that text, it is also about the world view, the attitudes with the, which the poem uh, conveyed. And a new, critic, a new critical framework is certainly one framework helped us to develop tools which will, uh, which will bring out these many aspects which are hidden uh, within a poem and only uh, this kind of a close reading will uh, enable us to do that. And uh, of course, the charge of elitism is something that we cannot uh, uh, get out of and that continues to be there. But he says, a decision between good art and bad art remains the unavoidable duty of criticism. So, elitism is a charge that no criticism can perhaps uh, escape and that is inevitable uh, well excess and uh, of course uh, since the 1960s with structuralism and later postmodernism we have come to this understanding that there is no kind of uh, objective evaluation which could be placed in terms of good art and bad art in terms of high art and low art but at the same time well like writing in the 1960s he says that is perhaps the business of uh, criticism to help us distinguish between good and bad. And uh, 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 even today when we think about the disciplinary frameworks, the kind of texts that are taught within classrooms, the kind of texts which do uh, quote unquote stand the test of time, there is a certain way in which we continue to use 
a lot of yardsticks in order to differentiate good uh, art from bad art. The humanities, he says, would abdicate their function in society if they surrender to a neutral scientist. So, uh, new criticism is not about scientism at all. It's about very subjective reading, experiential reading and experiential evaluation of literature and indifferent relativism or if they succumb to the imposition of alien norms required by political indoctrination. So, there are certain merits that Wellick continues to see in the new critical approach that it is devoid of any kind of uh, uh, scientific neutrality and it's devoid of any kind of political intervention which he says is important within this uh, field of humanities in order to sustain the value of literature, the inherent uh, power of literature. And in these new, in, in these two terms, he says, particularly on these two fronts, the new critics have waged a valiant fight, which I am afraid must be fought over and again in the future. So, he ends this very practical essay on this positive note that new criticism, while it lasted, had sent, had left behind a great legacy which uh, he sums up in these two aspects. One is to, uh, one is the inability, the, the refusal to surrender to neutral scientism and indifferent relativism and secondly to stay away, to stay strong in the midst of any kinds of political uh, indoctrination, in the, in the face of any kind of imposition of political indoctrination. I hope this uh, uh, essay will also encourage you to see new criticism in a different light altogether and also understand the historical role that they played in the emergence of literary criticism. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.